Welcome to the Clinical Research Podcast, bringing you the latest developments in research explained by our world-leading clinicians, academics and scientists based in Nottingham. The latest of our research heroes does one of the jobs in research that often remains unsung. She's a clinical research manager. Although Lindsay Craig is a nurse by background, her role now is more about making sure that studies run smoothly, that there are enough staff, that they're properly trained, they understand the particular research protocol, and that they're recruiting enough patients, amongst other things. Normally, planning is the key to all this, but when COVID-19 hit, planning joined the long list of things that became a luxury. I asked her how her job changed at that moment. Oh, God, I don't even know where to where to start really um it was a little bit surreal I suppose is a way of explaining it um none of it was normal um expectations really were unknown because we didn't have any sort of precedent for what we were dealing with um it was stressful um it was a little bit like walking through a black hole without a torch and making it up as we were going on a little bit, I think is the best way I can think of putting it. But you were clearly, you were leading people through the black hole without a torch as well. <laughs> you, doing it? Um, but, you know, all of that was done with teamwork. So it's really, really nice that somebody has nominated me Um for, for this and that I was successful but I didn't do any of it alone because I couldn't have done any of it without the colleagues that I've worked with especially Rebecca Bolton so it wasn't just me on my own it was always as part of a bigger team. How did it change on a day-to-day level was it you going from a sort of a, a fairly sort of predictable I guess regular <laughs> job managing all those things although it's a lot of responsibility to not really knowing what was coming next, I guess. Absolutely. So on a, on a day-to-day basis, I would have um, meetings with different teams set in. I'd be able to schedule different um, team plans for different days. So I'd have, for instance, diabetes would be my Monday. Tuesdays and Fridays, I would do HCOP. Thursdays, I would go over to City for cardiology. Um, that all went out the window. Um, we were floating between City and Queen's work some working at home um some sitting in funny little rooms with just my laptop and not a lot else um I unfortunately couldn't work clinically so I didn't work clinically um but I was there as a contact for the staff whenever they needed anything um you know our phones were always on if they needed something they would ring us uh, we've been doing on calls at weekends, so staff have had somewhere to call at a weekend as well. So we've been doing that ad hoc coming in on the weekends as well, especially over Christmas when it was incredibly busy. Um, and and no two days were the same. No plans ever worked. You would you would schedule something and you'd come to do it, and you go, no, can't do that. We'll have to do this. Um, a lot of it was thinking off the cuff and sort of responding on a rapid basis because if something happened you had to deal with it there and then everything else would just have to drop and you you'd deal with whatever you needed to deal with when it happened so it was um sort of throwing all your balls in the air and whichever one you caught first is what you did what a great metaphor about balls dropping <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that is one of the things, isn't it? Because generally research is very much about planning and things being controlled and organised ahead of time and just following through and executing your plan. And all that has completely changed, hasn't it, over the last year or so? We had no idea what was going to happen with COVID patients. And I think because, you know, we've had to learn quickly about COVID. We couldn't sit on our laurels and, and wait for information to come to us. Things were changing sometimes on an hourly basis. Um, For instance, the protocol changes, you'd have an hour notice that you're not doing something anymore. So that would suddenly be a lot of work that you'd have to drop everything else you were doing 
change all your patient information leaflets, take out things that you wouldn't need to be given to patients, make sure drugs were returned to pharmacists and support the nurses in doing all of that. So it was, it's been a very reactive 12 months, I think is the best way of putting it. You've not been able to plan as much as you would do normally. We've just had to get on and deal with what's come as it's come. Do you think partly because of that, that the research and innovations sort of position that a lot more people have become aware of exactly what it is that research nurses do. Absolutely. I think a lot of people have been quite surprised at what we do in research. I think there's quite the misconception that research nurses sit at a desk behind a computer gathering data. And actually it's, it couldn't, it's nowhere near that. It's, it's so far on the opposite extreme. Um, it's highlighted, I think, the skills that we need in researching um, these drugs and these patients. You know, it's not just um, data entry, it's the clinical skills that go alongside that and, and the fact that the nurses have to maintain those clinical skills and competencies as well. Um, it's been a massive learning experience for everybody. I also think it's brought all the research teams within the trust closer. Um, I think we were all quite segregated before, but I think it's having had COVID hit and the way we've responded as research and innovation across the trust, it's pulled everybody in much closer. We're working much closer across teams. We know more people. We've got more people that we can go and talk to and say, this is happening. How would you deal with it? So we've got a larger resource available now we're, we're a closer network within the trust i think from your um years of experience before covid hit what do you think was something that you learned in that time that you realized well i guess was either extremely valuable or was gonna no longer be the case sort of from the before and after point of view oh um I think the biggest learning for me is that we need to work better as a whole team. We've come together as a bigger research team rather than our own little ones. And for me, I think we are all research. And whilst we have our own little areas, we've all got different experiences. We've all got different knowledge. And no one person can do it without another. So I, I think I think for me, the biggest thing from it is teamwork. Right. Okay, um, finally, is there one moment that stands out for you from the whole COVID, you know, the last year or, or so, I guess, good, or maybe it's a bad moment? Is there one particular image or moment or incident or something? The biggest thing for me, when Becky and I started moving between Queens and City and providing cross-campus support, it was the way our staff felt they could come and ask us anything. And all of a sudden, we were working better as a team. We were starting to get more recruits. People were talking to each other more, and it felt like we were that one team. And we were doing it really well. So for me, the best thing would be is how everybody's just pulled together and worked together. There's been some horrifics. There's been lots of times I've gone home and, and cried. There's been challenges with medics, but we've got we've overcome it all. And actually, I think we've been quite successful about it all. But I think bringing lots of different people from different areas and getting it running amazingly as one team has been the best thing. I don't think we'll ever go back to the way we were. I think as research department, we've actually shown the trust what we are about. And I think we can only get bigger and better. And I think our position in the trust will be more at the forefront than it is now. Rather than research being that add-on, research is a priority above a lot of other things. From what I from what I know and what I've seen talking to people, is that if there's one sort of big example of that, it's dexamethasone, isn't it? Yeah. If if we hadn't have done this, if if research hadn't have happened for COVID, we wouldn't have got to the point we are now. So with dexamethasone proving that it was good, we had the hydroxychloroquine that we proved wasn't good. We proved plasma wasn't good. So it's not just about giving the benefits for research. It's about proving what doesn't work as well. But if we hadn't have done any of this, we still wouldn't have got through COVID. And we have got through it as a country. We've got through it really well. And as a trust, we've made a massive impact on that. 
I, I, know, I know it's things are still not quite back to normal. Did you go out and have a glass of Prosecco or something after you? Um, well, it's it's actually been my husband's and my birthdays over the last few days. So we've been out for some lunch and had some nice dog walks and a couple of pub gardens. So it's been nice. Brilliant. Thanks, Lindsay. Cheers. Bye-bye. So that was this episode's Research Hero. You can find more of them by subscribing to this podcast or visiting nuh.nhs.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening. There are links in the show notes for more information on clinical research in Nottingham and the website is nuh.nhs.uk forward slash research. Our email and social media links are there too. If you want to stay up to date with the Clinical Research Podcast, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google, wherever you normally get your podcasts. The more shows are rated and reviewed, the more search engines like them, and the easier it is for people to find us. So if you can subscribe and rate and review us, you'll be doing it for science, not just for our egos.